in a quiet town, shadowed by an ancient family secret, an outsider's innocent act unleashes an unspeakable horror. The Graham family, bound for generations to a monstrous legacy lurking in their cellar, faces their darkest fear as the curse of their bloodline erupts into chaos. As the town succumbs to a terrifying transformation, becoming ground zero for a global apocalypse, the world teeters on the brink of a new, feral era. This is a tale of a curse unbound, a family's legacy turned nightmare, and a world conquered by the age of the beast. Can anything, or anyone, stop the relentless spread of the lichen curse? Dive into the heart of darkness in this gripping story of survival, legacy, and the indomitable nature of fear. Chapter 1 the beast below, the Graham family's old manor, perched on the outskirts of a sleepy town, had always been the subject of whispered rumours, but within its aging walls, a secret far darker than mere gossip lay hidden. On this stormy night, as lightning cleaved the sky, the heavy rain muffled the sounds from below the house. In the dank, shadow-draped cellar, an ancient chain rattled eerily. The darkness was almost absolute, broken only by the occasional flicker of a distant storm, revealing glimpses of something sinister. There, bound by heavy iron chains, was a creature of nightmares. A werewolf, its once human features twisted into a grotesque mask of feral rage. Its eyes, glowing faintly in the dark, were filled with an unquenchable fire of hatred and hunger. With each thunderclap, it lunged violently, the chain straining against the brute force of the beast, echoing through the cellar like the bell of doom. Its growls were low and guttural, a sound born of centuries of confinement and fury. Above, in the house's cosy parlour, the Graham family gathered in a circle. Their heads were bowed, hands clasped tightly as they recited their nightly prayer. The ritual was as old as the curse itself, passed down through generations. Each word, murmured in unison, was a plea for protection, a chant to keep the darkness at bay. The room was filled with portraits of their ancestors, each face etched with the same solemn burden. The current generation of Grahams, John, the stern patriarch, Eliza, his devout wife, and their two children, young Ethan and curious Alice, all bore the weight of their lineage, a lineage marred by a chilling legacy, the beast that dwelled beneath their feet. As the prayer reached its crescendo, a loud clatter erupted from below, causing the family to pause, their hearts skipping a beat. It was a sound they had grown accustomed to, yet it never failed to instil a sense of dread. John's eyes met Eliza's, an unspoken understanding passing between them. The curse of their ancestor, a spectre from a bygone era, remained ever present, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurked within their own blood. Outside, unbeknownst to the Grahams, a lone figure approached the manor, seeking refuge from the storm. This stranger, Tom, would soon unwittingly set into motion a chain of events that would unearth long-buried secrets and challenge the very foundation of the Graham's existence. As the storm raged on, the boundaries between past and present, human and beast, began to blur, and the Graham family found themselves on the precipice of a terror that had been brewing for centuries. Chapter 2 The Legacy Passed Down The clock in the Graham family's old parlour chimed, its sound echoing through the corridors of the house a constant reminder of the passing of time. But in this home, time held a different meaning. It was both a guardian and a menace. John, as a boy of ten, remembered one such evening distinctly. The rain was tapping gently against the window pane as he sat in the study with his father, Edward Graham. The room was filled with the scent of old books and the smouldering embers of the fireplace. It was there that Edward decided to unveil the heavy mantle of their family's legacy to young John. 
His father's voice was steady, but laced with an undercurrent of something John could not quite understand then. Perhaps it was fear, or maybe sorrow. John, his father had begun, you are old enough now to understand the truth about our family. The secret we guard is not just a matter of tradition, it is a matter of survival. He told John of their ancestor, a man of noble stature and good heart, who had fallen prey to a terrible curse. In the 1800s, transformed into a werewolf, he became a creature of the night, driven by primal instincts. This beast in our cellar, your great, great, great grandfather, is beyond redemption, Edward had said, his eyes reflecting the flames from the hearth. He is driven by an insatiable hunger, a desire to hunt and kill. We cannot reason with him, for he thinks not as a man, but as a feral wolf. Edward had taken a deep breath before continuing. We are the keepers of this curse, John. The chains and our prayers are all that keep the beast at bay. Should he ever break free, he will be an unstoppable force of evil and destruction. Each person he bites will become like him, a slave to the curse of the lichen, spreading the affliction far. John remembered feeling a cold shiver run down his spine as his father spoke. The weight of responsibility had suddenly felt very real, very heavy. There is no cure for this curse, Edward had concluded. Our family has tried for generations. We can only hope to contain it, to prevent the darkness from spreading. As John sat there, listening to his father, the shadows of the study seemed to grow longer, darker. The gravity of his inheritance had settled on his young shoulders that night, an inheritance of eternal vigilance against a horror that lay chained in their own home. Years had passed since that night, and John had grown into the role of the family's protector, but the words of his father lingered in his mind like an unending echo. There is no stop in the beast, only the hope of holding it at bay. Chapter 3 The Uninvited Guest On that fateful night, as the storm raged outside, cast in the Graham family's manor in a silhouette of foreboding shadows, there came a knock at the door. It was an unexpected sound that cut through the howling wind and the family's evening prayers. John, cautious and wary, opened the door to find a stranger standing in the downpour. The man, soaked to the bone, introduced himself as Tom, a traveller caught unawares by the violent storm. He pleaded for shelter, his eyes begging for compassion. But John, bound by the unspeakable secret they harboured, could not risk a stranger's presence. You are not welcome here, he stated firmly his voice barely concealing the fear of what lay beneath their home. With those cold words, he shut the door in the stranger's face, leaving Tom to the mercy of the storm. Rejected and desperate, Tom scanned the manor's grounds for any form of refuge. Ignoring the private property and keep out signs, he scaled a high wall and a fence, finally stumbling upon an old tool shed. It was far from comfortable, but it would have to do until the storm subsided. As Tom settled in, trying to shake off the cold, he heard an odd sound. At first, it seemed like chanting, distant and almost melodic. Then came the unsettling noise of chains and a deep, guttural growling. Tom's heart raced. It sounded like a dog in distress. Driven by concern and curiosity, he ventured closer to the source of the sounds. He found a small opening, a narrow window that peered into what looked like a cellar. It wasn't big enough for him to climb through, but he could see inside. The rattling of chains and the growling grew louder. You there, boy? Tom called out, mistaking the sounds for a trapped animal. As he reached his hand inside, hoping to offer some solace to what he thought was a dog, the noises intensified. Suddenly, there was a sound like chains being violently pulled, as if an animal were trying to break free. 
Come on, boy. I'll get you out. Tom said, his voice a mix of worry and determination. Without warning, a chain snapped. Something from the darkness latched onto Tom's arm. He yanked his hand back in reflex, feeling the sharp pain of teeth puncturing his skin. Ah, stay in there then, Tom exclaimed, a mix of anger and shock in his voice. As he staggered back into the storm, nursing his wound, he was unaware of the gravity of what had just transpired. The bite, seemingly superficial, was more than just an injury. It was the awakening of an ancient curse. As he wandered off into the night, the true horror of what lay within the Graham family's cellar remained unseen. But now, it had made its first contact with the outside world. Chapter 4 The Beast Awakens Hours after the harrowing encounter at the Graham Manor, Tom, still a stranger to the small town, found his way to a local cafe. The storm had subsided, leaving behind a palpable sense of unease. As he entered, his appearance drew immediate attention. His arm was bleeding, the wound appearing far from normal. What happened? asked a concerned patron, eyeing the injury with a mix of curiosity and worry. Damn dog bit me, Tom grumbled, his voice rough and strained. He slumped onto a chair, his exhaustion palpable. Give me a coffee, he demanded more than requested. The woman behind the counter obliged, her brows knitted in concern. Here, put this bandage on it, she said, offering him a first aid kit. Tom sat motionless for a while, his coffee untouched, his head resting on his arm. The staff exchanged worried glances. One of them gently nudged him. You okay, mister? Just so tired, Tom mumbled, his voice barely audible. In the background, the owner of the cafe began to restock the fridge with fresh supplies, including raw meat. At the sight and smell of it, Something primal stirred within Tom. His senses heightened unnaturally, fixated on the meat. Without warning, Tom leapt over the counter, pushing the owner aside with alarming strength. He began to consume the raw meat with a wild, animalistic fervor. The sight was shocking, his actions incomprehensible. Call the police, shouted the owner, trying to pull Tom away. But Tom turned, snarling, a wild look in his eyes that was inhuman, feral. Soon after, the police arrived. They shouted at Tom to back away and lay down, but he was oblivious to their commands. As one officer approached, Tom's face contorted into a mask of bestial rage. He lunged at the officer, biting him viciously on the arm. The other officer, in a panic and self-defense, opened fire. Tom collapsed to the floor, his body going still. He bit me, exclaimed the bitten officer, clutching his arm in pain and shock. An ambulance arrived promptly, whisking away Tom's body and the injured officer, who was already en route to the hospital for urgent treatment. Little did they know, the incident at the cafe was just the beginning. The curse that the Grahams had fought so hard to contain was now unleashed, its effects starting to ripple through the town in a way no one could have anticipated. Chapter 5 The Curse Unleashed The night in the small town descended into chaos, a terror unleashed that was beyond anyone's worst nightmares. As the ambulance personnel loaded what they believed to be Tom's lifeless body into their vehicle, a sudden unsettling movement caught their attention. Is that normal? One of the paramedics asked, a note of fear in his voice as he observed the body beginning to twitch and spasm under the cover. Before either could react, a horrific transformation occurred. The body mass visibly grew, morphing into something grotesque and unnatural. In a terrifying moment, the cover was violently thrown off revealing not the man they had loaded, but a monstrous werewolf. With features of a wolf, but standing on two legs, the beast, in a fit of pure rage, leapt at the nearest ambulance worker, 
biting and clawing in a frenzied assault. The second paramedic suffered the same fate before the creature darted off into the night, its howl echoing ominously throughout the town. Shocked shop owners and bystanders came out to witness the commotion, only to be greeted by a scene of blood-curdling carnage. The two bodies of the ambulance workers lay motionless in pools of blood. Then, to the horror of the onlookers, the bodies began twitching. Muscles spasmed and contorted as the two men underwent a grotesque transformation, rising up as feral, raging werewolves. Panic ensued as the shop owners screamed, desperately trying to lock themselves in their establishments. But their efforts were in vain as the newly turned werewolves smashed through doors and windows, assaulting anyone in their path with ruthless savagery. Meanwhile, at the hospital, the officer who had been bitten by Tom in the cafe was undergoing a similar horrifying metamorphosis. In the emergency room, amidst the hustle and bustle of medical staff, the officer's body convulsed uncontrollably. As the staff tried to restrain him, thinking it to be a seizure, the transformation completed. He stood, now a monstrous werewolf, eyes glinting with primal fury. The hospital erupted into screams and chaos as the werewolf launched itself at the unsuspecting medical personnel and patients, security guards, and police called to the scene were met with a creature of nightmares, far beyond their training or understanding. Back in the town, the night was filled with howls and screams, a symphony of terror. The curse that the Graham family had contained for generations had broken free, multiplying and spreading like wildfire. The town was now facing an epidemic of lycanthropy, a disaster they were wholly unprepared for. As the night progressed, the situation grew more dire, with no apparent solution in sight, and the full moon watching over the town like a silent, ominous witness to the unfolding horror. Chapter 6 Desperate Measures In a matter of days, the once peaceful town had transformed into a nightmarish epicentre of lycanthropy. The rapid spread of the curse left the authorities with no choice but to call in the military. A perimeter was swiftly established around the town, a formidable barrier against the Lycan outbreak. Tanks, heavy machine guns and the latest in military technology formed an impenetrable line of defence. General Williams, in charge of the operation, surveyed the scene with a grim expression if just one of these creatures gets out, the entire country is doomed, he stated gravely to his aides. His voice carried the weight of the dire situation, each word underscored by the seriousness of their task. As they strategized, a bone-chilling howl cut through the air. Two lichens, their eyes glowing with feral intensity, charged at the perimeter. The soldiers responded immediately, unleashing a barrage of heavy gunfire. The creatures were hit repeatedly, sustaining extreme injuries, but to the shock of everyone watching, they soon rose again, retreating back into the town with a resilience that defied logic. General Williams turned to his team, his face hardening. We are pursuing the idea of using nukes, he said, a hint of reluctance in his voice the very thought of such an extreme measure was a testament to their desperation. Conventional weapons don't seem to have any lasting effect on them. He looked out over the desolate town, now a battleground between humanity and a curse centuries old. I think we can contain them for now, he continued, but we need a more permanent solution and fast. This isn't just a fight against monsters, it's a race against time. The grim reality of their situation hung in the air. The military might have been able to hold the perimeter, but the question of how to eliminate the threat without resorting to catastrophic measures remained unanswered. As the general and his team delved into heated discussions, 
The sounds of howls and gunfire continued to echo in the background, a constant reminder of the battle that raged just beyond the barrier. Chapter 7 The Last Stand at Graham Manor Within the confines of their ancestral home, the Graham family bore witness to the chaos that had engulfed their town. Their manor, a solitary beacon in the midst of the military-imposed perimeter, stood out as an island of relative calm in a sea of turmoil. As the lichens approached the manor, a primal roar echoed from the cellar. The beast, sensing its kin, clamoured for freedom with a fury that shook the very foundations of the house. But the Grahams, steadfast in their duty, began their ancient prayers, a ritual passed down from father to son. These prayers seemed to create an invisible barrier, repelling the encroaching lichens. Somewhere, it spread, John murmured, his voice a mix of disbelief and dread. All we can do is stay here and protect the beast. If he escapes, no one out there will stand a chance. Outside, the sound of gunfire grew closer, signalling the approach of the military. Through a window, John saw armed forces converging on their manor. It became evident that they had noticed something peculiar, the lichen's inability to cross onto the Graham property. A short while later, a knock sounded at the door more assertive than any visitor before. John cautiously opened it to find a captain and a team of six soldiers. They entered quickly, securing the door behind them. One of them radioed in. We're here. The captain, eyeing the Graham family, asked bluntly, What's your story? You need to leave. This is private property, John replied his tone firm yet laced with an underlying urgency. I don't think so, the captain countered, his gaze piercing. We've observed the lichens. They're being repelled from your manor, and we need answers. The tension in the room escalated as two worlds collided. The military, desperate for a solution to a crisis beyond their understanding, and the Graham family, guardians of a centuries-old curse, John knew that the secrets of the Graham Manor were now on the verge of being exposed. Whether this revelation would bring salvation or further damnation was a question that hung heavily in the air, as the howls of the lichens outside mingled with the steady rhythm of military discipline. Chapter 8 The Unleashing The howl that resonated from the basement of the Graham Manor was unlike anything the military team had ever heard. It was a sound that seemed to embody pure, unadulterated menace. What's that noise? The captain demanded, his hand instinctively rested on his weapon. That, John said with a gravitas that silenced the room, is mankind's doom. If you venture down there, you will unleash a prophecy of man's end. The lichens outside are mere shadows compared to the beast in the cellar. It cannot be stopped, only subdued. The captain, skeptical yet intrigued, made a decision. We'll take a look. John positioned himself defiantly in front of the cellar door. My sworn duty is to keep it locked away, even if it costs my life. There will be no life if it escapes. But the military team driven by urgency and desperation, pushed him aside aggressively. The Graham family, realising their pleas were in vain, began to form a circle, chanting their ancient prayers with renewed fervour. As the team descended into the basement, the distant sounds of gunfire and howls filtered through the air, a chaotic symphony of the battle raging outside. The basement was dark, an abyss, that seemed to swallow all light. As they opened the heavily bolted door, they peered into the gloom. There, in the shadows, they could just make out a figure. The beast, a nightmare made flesh. Upstairs, the Graham family continued their chant, a desperate plea for containment, but their voices faltered as they heard gunfire and screams emanating from below, followed by a haunting silence. 
Then came the sound of heavy footsteps ascending the basement stairs. The family's chant grew more intense, a futile effort to ward off the inevitable. They watched, hearts pounding in terror, as the creature, now free from its chains, walked past them, its eyes glowing with an unholy light. The beast paused for a moment, as if acknowledging the futile efforts of the family before exiting the house into the night. The Graham Manor, once a stronghold against the curse, had fallen. The ultimate horror, the source of the curse, was now unleashed upon the world. The family's chants faded into a mournful whisper, their legacy shattered. The night air was filled with the sound of howls, a chorus of the damned, as the creature merged with its kin, leading an army of nightmares into the darkness. Chapter 9 The Fall of the Perimeter At the military's fortified blockade, General Williams and his troops braced themselves for another assault. The air was tense, heavy with anticipation and fear. Soldiers manned their posts, weapons at the ready, eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of the lichens. There they come again, General Williams muttered, his voice betraying a hint of fatigue from the relentless attacks. But this time, something was different. Among the approaching lichens, a massive figure stood out, dwarfing its kin in both size and aura of menace. Look at the size of that one, the general exclaimed. A sense of dread settling in, the soldiers trained their weapons on the approaching horde, focusing on the colossal beast leading the pack. As they opened fire, a chilling realization dawned on them. Their bullets, which had at least slowed down the other lichens, seemed to have no effect on this behemoth. It kept moving forward, an unstoppable force of nature, as if each bullet was nothing more than a nuisance. Behind the beast, hundreds of townsfolk turned lichens followed, a horrifying testament to the curse's rapid spread. The soldiers' fire did little to stem the tide, as the lichens, emboldened by the presence of their formidable leader, surged forward with renewed ferocity. The beast reached the barrier, and with a display of brute strength, began to tear through the defences as if they were made of paper. Soldiers, caught off guard by the sheer power of the creature, were overwhelmed in moments. The screams of the fallen filled the air as they, too, began to transform into the very monsters they had fought against. At military headquarters, far from the chaos, Officers listened in horror over the radio. General Williams's voice, once steady and commanding, was now filled with terror and desperation. They've broken through, he screamed, the sound of destruction and mayhem echoing through the transmission. The line went dead, leaving the room in stunned silence. The last bastion of defense had fallen, and with it, any semblance of hope they had of containing the outbreak, the curse, that had been a dark secret of the Graham family for centuries, was now a catastrophe on a scale never before seen, a nightmare unleashed upon the world. Chapter 10 The Age of the Beast Three months following the catastrophic breach at the military perimeter, the world had undergone a transformation so profound and terrifying that it was unrecognisable. The Lycan Curse unleashed from the depths of the Graham family's cellar, had spread with an alarming speed and ferocity, engulfing cities, towns and villages across the globe. Human civilization, as it had been known, ceased to exist. The relentless spread of the lichens left no corner of the world untouched. Major cities, once bustling hubs of activity, lay in ruins, their skyline shattered, streets abandoned. The night was filled with the haunting howls of the lichens, a constant reminder of the new rulers of the planet. Society had crumbled under the onslaught. Governments and military forces, overwhelmed and outmatched, fell one after the other. Attempts at creating safe havens or developing a cure were futile, crushed under the overwhelming numbers of the lichens. Human survivors were few, scattered across the globe hiding in remote areas, 
always on the move to avoid detection. The world had entered a new era, the age of the beast. The lichens, now the dominant species, roamed the lands freely. The curse had bonded them into packs, creating a new, brutal social order. The knights belonged to them, filled with their hunts and howls, echoing in the eerie silence of the abandoned human world. Nature began to reclaim what was once hers. Forests grew over crumbled buildings. Wild animals returned to the places once inhabited by humans, and the skies cleared of pollution. In a dark, twisted way, the planet was healing, returning to a state untouched by human hands. Humanity's legacy was reduced to whispers in the wind, echoes of a once thriving civilization now lost. The Graham family's curse had not only destroyed their lineage, but had rewritten the course of history, plunging the world into a primordial darkness where only the strongest, the Lycans, survived. In this new age under the rule of the beast, the earth had grown wild and untamed, a stark reminder of the fragility of human existence and the destructive power of ancient curses left unchecked. In a world ravaged by ferocious werewolves, humanity teeters on the brink of extinction. Desperate survivors stumble upon a chilling discovery, a virus that transforms these unstoppable beasts into something arguably worse, the mindless undead. As they unleash this new horror in a frantic bid for survival, they face a haunting question. Have they traded one nightmare for another? Dive into a heart-pounding journey where every choice is a gamble for humanity's future and every shadow hides a threat more terrifying than the last. Prepare to enter a world where the line between saviour and destroyer blurs, in a battle for survival where the stakes are nothing less than humanity's last stand. Chapter 1 The Fall of Civilization The world had changed. It was no longer the domain of bustling cities, teeming with life and the hum of humanity. Now it was a realm of shadows and fear, ruled by creatures of nightmare. The werewolves had taken over. It had started subtly at first, incidents reported as wild animal attacks in remote locations. But then, the horror spilled into the cities. With each full moon, more and more fell prey to the werewolves' curse. The infection spread like wildfire. Every bite from these monstrous beings transformed the victim into one of them. Within months, the cities, those great hubs of civilization, had fallen. Skyscrapers, once symbols of human achievement, now stood as haunting silhouettes against the moonlit sky, their windows like lifeless eyes gazing down on the desolate streets. The nights were filled with the howls of the werewolves echoing through the empty avenues and abandoned vehicles. What was once vibrant urban life had been replaced by the rule of the lycanthropes. Humanity was forced to retreat. Survivors fled to rural areas, farmlands, and hidden enclaves in the mountains. These places, once considered remote and isolated, became sanctuaries for the remnants of mankind. Here, Far from the ruined cities, small communities clung to life. They fortified old farms, abandoned schools, and any structure that could offer shelter. Life had become a daily struggle for survival, gathering resources by day while barricading themselves at night against the ever-present threat of a werewolf attack. Rumors swirled among the survivors. Some spoke of military safe zones, others of a group of scientists working on a cure. But as the days turned into weeks and weeks into months, hope began to dwindle. The werewolves were too many, too strong. The full moon nights were the worst. A time when the howls of the werewolves filled the air, a grim reminder of the world that was lost. This new world was a place of constant vigilance. Lookouts were stationed day and night, 
watching for the telltale signs of a werewolf pack on the prowl. Children grew up knowing the importance of silence and the dangers of the night. The stories of the past, of movie theatres, shopping malls and bustling city life seemed like fairy tales from another age. In these desperate times, trust was a rare commodity. Bands of survivors occasionally crossed paths, exchanging news and supplies, but always with a wary eye. The fear of betrayal was real, not just from fellow humans, but from the possibility that one among them could be hiding the curse, waiting for the next full moon to reveal their true nature. As the first chapter of this harrowing tale closes, the stage is set for a world hanging in the balance where the remnants of humanity are on the brink of extinction. The werewolves reign supreme in the urban jungles, their howls a haunting melody of the new world order. But among the whispers of the wind, in the heart of the rural hideouts, a flicker of hope remains. Little do the survivors know, a discovery lies waiting, one that could change the course of this apocalyptic nightmare. But with it, comes the risk of unleashing something even more terrifying than the beasts that roam the night. Chapter 2 The Journey to Hope As the dawn broke over the rugged landscape, casting long shadows across the makeshift settlement, three figures huddled around a dimly lit map. They were an unlikely trio, brought together by circumstance and a shared goal to find a cure for the werewolf curse. Captain Marcus Donovan a grizzled military veteran ran his finger along a faded route on the map. His years in the service had prepared him for many things, but the fall of civilization was not one of them. Despite this, he remained a natural leader, his demeanour exuding a calm authority that was reassuring in these uncertain times. Beside him stood Dr. Lena Nguyen, a brilliant virologist whose research had been on the brink of breakthroughs before the world fell apart. Her eyes, once full of academic curiosity, now held a determined glint, the kind born of loss and a relentless drive to make things right. Completing the trio was Dr. Alexei Petrov, a molecular biologist with a knack for genetics. He had joined forces with Dr. Nguyen after a chance encounter, both sharing the same passion for finding a cure. Alexei's expertise was a crucial piece of the puzzle in understanding the werewolf virus. The three had heard whispers of a military facility deep in the heart of what was once a thriving urban center. Rumors suggested that it held research crucial to developing a cure. It was a long shot, but long shots were all they had left. Packing light but efficiently, they set out just before sunrise. Marcus led the way his rifle always within easy reach. Lena carried a portable lab kit, essential for any samples they might find. Alexei brought up the rear, his backpack filled with electronic gadgets that might be useful in accessing the facility. The journey was fraught with danger. They traversed through dense forests and overgrown fields, avoiding the main roads that were often patrolled by werewolf packs. It was during one of these treks that they encountered their first real brush with danger. A low growl echoed through the hen trees, stopping them in their tracks. Heartbeats quickened as they crouched low, hidden in the underbrush. Through the foliage, they glimpsed the slinking forms of a werewolf pack, their eyes glowing ominously in the dim light. The tension was palpable as the creatures sniffed the air, dangerously close to their hiding spot. It was Marcus's calm, steady hand that signaled them to remain absolutely still. Minutes felt like hours until the pack moved on, leaving the trio to exhale in silent relief. As the sun began to set, they finally reached the outskirts of the facility. It was a sprawling complex, surrounded by high walls and barbed wire. Nature had begun to reclaim the once sterile grounds, with vines creeping up the sides of the buildings. Finding a way in wasn't easy. The main gates were locked and heavily fortified. It was Alexei who spotted an old drainage system, partially hidden by overgrowth. Working together, 
they pried open the rusted grate and made their way through the narrow tunnels. Emerging inside the compound, they found themselves in a world frozen in time. Papers were strewn about, equipment lay abandoned, and a thick layer of dust covered everything. It was an eerie reminder of how quickly everything had changed. There was no time to dwell on the past. The facility held secrets, perhaps the key to turning the tide in this relentless struggle. As they ventured deeper into the heart of the complex, the sense of anticipation grew. What they found could be their last hope, a beacon in the darkness of a world overrun by beasts. But as they were soon to discover, some secrets come with a price. Chapter 3 The Siege of Shadows The night was clear, stars twinkling in a sky, unmarred by the lights of civilization. In a secluded woodland clearing, a small band of survivors huddled around a flickering campfire, their faces etched with the weariness of constant vigilance. This was their refuge, a makeshift camp, fortified with whatever materials they could scavenge, barbed wire wooden spikes, and an array of rudimentary alarm systems made from cans and strings. Despite their exhaustion, there was an air of camaraderie among them. They had become a family of sorts, bound together by the shared goal of survival in a world that had turned against them. Their camp, though humble, was a bastion of humanity in the midst of chaos. Suddenly, the tranquil night air was shattered by the shrill ringing of the alarm system. Panic ensued as everyone sprang into action, grabbing weapons and rushing to their defensive positions. The camp, usually so full of life and laughter, became a battleground. From the darkness of the surrounding woods, they came. Hundreds of werewolves, their eyes glowing with a feral hunger, descended upon the camp with ferocious speed. The air was filled with the sounds of snarling, growling, and the desperate cries of the survivors. The defenders fought bravely, but they were overwhelmingly outnumbered. The makeshift barricades, so carefully constructed, were torn apart like paper. Each horrific bite from the werewolves turned another human into a lycanthrope, swelling their ranks even as the human numbers dwindled. The camp, once a symbol of human resilience, was quickly overrun. Tents were ripped apart, the fire trampled underfoot and the air filled with the scent of fear and blood. It was a massacre, swift and brutal. The werewolves moved through the camp with ruthless efficiency, leaving behind only destruction and the newly turned werewolves who rose to join their ranks. In the aftermath, the clearing that had once been a haven of hope and survival lay in ruins. The few survivors who had managed to escape disappeared into the night carrying with them the harrowing memories of the siege and the devastating loss of their sanctuary. The night grew silent once more, the stars now witnesses to a world where humanity was not just fighting for survival, but slowly losing its very essence to the encroaching darkness. The transformation of the camp into a lair of werewolves was a chilling reminder of the relentless tide of the lycanthropic plague, a tide that was washing away the last remnants of the world as it once was. Chapter 4 The Ethical Dilemma The abandoned military base, once a hive of activity and scientific inquiry, now lay in silent desolation. Captain Marcus Donovan led the way, his flashlight cutting through the darkness revealing long corridors lined with abandoned equipment. Dr. Lena and Nguyen and Dr. Alexei Petrov followed closely, their own flashlights darting around, illuminating forgotten remnants of a world lost to chaos. Their footsteps echoed in the empty halls until they reached the main laboratory. The door, ajar, creaked ominously as they pushed it open. Inside the lab was a time capsule of the last days before the collapse. Papers were scattered across desks, whiteboards filled with complex formulas, and computers stood idle, their screens dark. As they sifted through the documents, a chilling realization dawned on them. 
The notes detailed exhaustive research on the werewolf virus, its effects, and potential countermeasures. But one entry stood out. There was no cure for the werewolf curse. The scientists had, however, stumbled upon something else. A virus that targeted both humans and lichens. Dr. Nguyen read aloud, her voice steady but tinged with disbelief. This virus, it's unlike anything we've known. It seems to spread at an alarming rate, potentially faster than the lichen transformation. But it's not selective. It could infect the remaining human population as well. The room fell silent as the gravity of the discovery settled upon them. Captain Donovan, ever the pragmatist, was the first to break the silence. If we use this, we're no better than those who unleashed the werewolf curse. We'd be condemning what's left of humanity. Dr. Petrov, his face pale under the harsh light, added, but if we don't, the lichens will continue to turn more humans. It's only a matter of time before we're completely overrun. The ethical dilemma hung heavily in the air. On one hand, they had the means to stop the werewolves, potentially saving countless lives. But on the other, using such a virus was a betrayal of their own humanity, risking the very people they were trying to save. Dr Nguyen, her voice tinged with sorrow, concluded, We're not just scientists or soldiers. We're guardians of what's left of this world. Whatever choice we make, we carry the weight of humanity's future. The team stood in the lab, surrounded by the ghosts of a once great civilization, grappling with a decision that no one should ever have to make. The fate of the world lay in their hands, and whatever path they chose, it would irreversibly alter the course of human history. The question was not just about survival, it was about what it meant to be human in a world that had lost its humanity. Chapter 5 The Unthinkable Discovery In the midst of their heavy deliberation, a faint but distinct sound cut through the silence, a rhythmic knocking like someone tapping on glass. Intrigued and cautious, the team followed the sound, their flashlights casting long, eerie shadows in the abandoned corridors of the facility. They moved from room to room, the sound growing steadily louder until they came upon a large, sealed glass capsule. Inside, illuminated by their flashlights, was a man, but it was immediately clear that he was no ordinary man. His skin had a ghastly pallor, his eyes were lifeless, and he moved with an unsettling, jerky motion. He was undead, a zombie, relentlessly thumping against the glass with a mindless determination. Pinned to the capsule was a note, the handwriting shaky, as if written in haste or under great stress. Captain Donovan carefully removed it, and Dr Nguyen read it aloud. It was a message from Dr Stephen Lestat, a name recognised by the team as one of the leading researchers in lycanthropic studies. The note revealed a harrowing truth. We have finally infected a werewolf with the virus. It is contained in this capsule. The virus took away the werewolf curse, but the werewolf has turned into this thing, a zombie. The creature does not care if you are human or wolf, it wants to feed on you. But should a werewolf bite this thing, they too will change into another zombie. I could not bring myself to unleash this upon the world. If you find this, may you have the courage to do what I could not. The team stood in stunned silence, the implications of Dr. Lestat's message sinking in. The zombie before them was not just a mindless creature. It was potentially the key to stopping the werewolf plague, but the cost was unimaginable. A new horror unleashed upon the world. Dr. Petrov broke the silence, his voice a mixture of awe and fear. This could end the werewolf threat, but at what price? We'd be replacing one curse with another. Captain Donovan, his eyes fixed on the zombie, replied grimly, 
It's a decision between two evils. Do we let humanity fall to werewolves, or do we risk it all on a chance to fight back, even if it means unleashing a new terror? Dr. Nguyen added, Dr. Lestat couldn't do it. He chose to contain the threat rather than release it. Are we prepared to make a different choice? The weight of the decision hung heavily in the air. The zombie in the capsule, a grotesque testament to human desperation and scientific meddling, represented a solution as dangerous as the problem it was meant to solve. The team stood at a crossroads, facing a choice that would determine the fate of what remained of the world. In their hands was a weapon of unimaginable power, but its use required a courage that bordered on recklessness. A courage to possibly save humanity or damn it further. Chapter 6 The Desperate Gambit The tense silence of the lab was shattered by a distant haunting howl, followed by a crescendo of noises, crashes, growls, and the sound of paws pounding against the facility's floors. Captain Marcus Donovan's voice cut through the chaos, decisive and grim. They found us. We need to make a choice now. We either die here or let this thing out. Outside the lab, the werewolves were a storm of fur and fangs. They had picked up the scent of the humans and were now relentlessly hunting them down. The facility, once a bastion of human ingenuity, became a hunting ground for these merciless predators. As the werewolves crashed into the main lab, a lone figure caught their attention. A shambling, mindless zombie, wandering aimlessly amidst the chaos. Instinctively, the werewolves attacked, their bites tearing into the undead flesh. But within seconds, a horrific transformation began. The werewolves that had bitten the creature started convulsing, their bodies warping and twisting until they too resumed a human form. But it was a grotesque mockery of humanity. They became shambling, mindless zombies, devoid of the power and ferocity that had once made them so formidable. From behind the safety of a locked room with a reinforced glass window, Captain Donovan, Dr. Nguyen, and Dr. Petrov watched the unfolding nightmare. More and more werewolves piled into the facility, drawn by the commotion. Each one that attacked the stumbling creatures met the same fate, their bodies undergoing the hideous transformation into the undead. The werewolves' strength and agility, which had once made them nearly invincible hunters, were now rendered moot. The newly created zombies just stumbled around aimlessly, their threat vastly different from that of the werewolves. They lacked the intelligence and purpose that had characterized the lycanthropes, becoming instead a horde of wandering husks. Captain Donovan and his team witnessed the rapid spread of the virus, a viral wildfire consuming the werewolf menace, but at a terrible cost. The sight was sobering and terrifying. They had unleashed a new horror into the world, one that, while less formidable than the werewolves, presented a chilling new reality. As the last of the werewolves fell and rose again as zombies, the lab became eerily quiet filled only with the soft, aimless shuffling of the undead. The team was safe for the moment, but the world outside the reinforced glass had changed irrevocably. The werewolf threat might have been neutralized, but now they faced a new, unknown future with a different kind of monster, one of their own making. Chapter 7 A Dangerous Weapon as the team surveyed the eerie stillness of the lab, Dr. Leona Nguyen's voice cut through, determined and resolute. I need some of their blood. Those syringes over there. Let's fill them up. Captain Donovan frowned, his voice laced with concern. It's too dangerous. We don't know enough about this virus. Despite his protest, they knew the value of this opportunity. With careful precision, they trapped one of the undead, a former werewolf now mindlessly wandering. 
Using makeshift tools and working with clinical efficiency, they drew multiple syringes of the creature's infected blood. After the procedure, they disposed of the undead body, ensuring no threat remained in their immediate vicinity. Dr. Ngu Yen then attached one of the syringes to the end of a long pole, effectively creating a spear-like weapon. This makeshift tool carried with it the potential to turn any werewolf it pierced into a zombie, a weapon of last resort. With their grim task completed, the trio made their way out of the facility, moving stealthily to avoid attracting attention. The world outside seemed even more foreboding now, a landscape fraught with dangers both known and unknown. Their journey back to camp was tense and fraught with peril. At one point, a lone werewolf, drawn by their scent or perhaps just wandering aimlessly, lunged at them from the shadows. Reacting swiftly, Dr. Ngu Yen thrust her syringe-equipped spear at the beast. The creature convulsed as the virus took hold, transforming before their eyes into a shambling undead. Quickly adapting to this new turn of events, they restrained the zombie, tying its hands and fashioning a makeshift catch pole around its neck. This allowed them to keep it at a distance, using it both as a shield and a deterrent against any other werewolves they might encounter on their journey. The journey back to camp was a surreal procession, a small group of humans escorting a captured zombie through a world that was no longer theirs. The undead creature, once a symbol of terror, was now a tool in their desperate fight for survival. As they neared their camp, the realization of what they had done began to sink in. They had crossed a line, venturing into uncharted, ethical territory. The virus they carried, both in the syringe and in the form of their captive zombie, was a double-edged sword a weapon against the werewolves, but also a potential threat to what remained of humanity. Their arrival at camp would mark not just a return, but the beginning of a new, uncertain chapter in their struggle for survival. They had new hope, but at what cost? This question lingered in the air, as palpable as the tension that surrounded them. Chapter 8 The Unwelcome Truth Back at the camp, a place that once represented a haven of safety and unity. The atmosphere was now heavy with tension and unease. The camp leader, a stern and resilient figure who had guided the survivors through countless perils, confronted the team about their controversial decision. Why would you unleash such a thin upon an already dying world? The leader demanded, his voice tinged with a mix of anger and disbelief. Dr. Lena Nguyen stepped forward, her voice calm but firm. We've seen what the werewolves can do. They're fast, strong, and nearly impossible to kill. We can at least outrun, outthink, and possibly survive against the undead. But against the werewolves, we stand no chance. Before the leader could rebuke them further, two strangers, weary and disheveled, stumbled into the camp. They were survivors from another hidden camp, one that had been mentioned in hopeful whispers around the fire. The newcomers told a harrowing tale of a brutal massacre, their well-fortified and armed settlement falling within mere seconds to a relentless werewolf assault. The werewolves are too powerful, one of the survivors gasped, his eyes haunted by the horrors he had witnessed. Our defences meant nothing. If they find you, there's no escape. The stark reality of their words silenced any further debate. The camp, despite its defences, was not as secure as they had believed. As the camp absorbed this grim news, Captain Donovan noticed a commotion at the edge of the camp. He moved to a vantage point that overlooked a small city in the distance. Through his binoculars, he witnessed a staggering scene. A horde of undead, the very creatures they had released into the world, were shuffling into the city. Almost immediately, they were set upon by a pack of werewolves. The ensuing chaos was a macabre dance of death and transformation. Each werewolf that attacked the undead convulsed and twisted. 
soon join in the ranks of the shambling zombies. For a moment, Captain Donovan couldn't tear his eyes away from the spectacle. It was both horrifying and mesmerizing, a testament to the drastic lengths they had gone to for a chance at survival. As he lowered his binoculars, a heavy silence fell over the camp. The sight of the city, now a battleground between werewolf and undead, was a stark reminder of the new reality they had created. There was no going back now. The world they knew had been irrevocably altered, and the consequences of their actions would ripple through what remained of humanity. The camp, once a beacon of hope and solidarity, now faced a future fraught with uncertainty and fear. But amidst the despair, there was a glimmer of grim determination. If they were to survive in this new world, they would need to adapt, to evolve, and to face the consequences of their choices head on. The night closed in, the campfire flickering like the last ember of a world that once was, now giving way to a future unknown and unwritten. Chapter 9 Clash of Monsters and the Rising Tide In the crumbling city, the night air was thick with the sounds of a grotesque battle. Werewolves, once the apex predators, found themselves under siege by the relentless advance of the undead. Each savage bite from the zombies transformed the werewolves, stripping them of their power and turning them into more of the shambling horde. Amidst this chaos, one werewolf stood out. It was a monstrous creature, twice the size of its kin, with a cunning intelligence shining in its eyes. This alpha werewolf, a giant among its kind, surveyed the pandemonium with a calculating gaze. It understood the deadly implications of the zombies' bites. Instead of engaging with teeth, it used its razor-sharp claws, tearing through the undead with a ferocity and precision that was terrifying to behold. Its agility was unmatched, its strength seemingly otherworldly. It carved a swath through the horde, flesh and decay flying in its wake. With a final defiant howl, the alpha werewolf leaped onto a nearby rooftop, its powerful muscles propelling it effortlessly. In a few bounds, it disappeared into the shadows of the night, leaving behind the carnage it had wrought. It was a survivor, adapting to the new threat in a way that its transformed pack could not. Meanwhile, back at the base, the survivors faced a new, imminent danger. A horde of zombies, the very monsters they had unleashed, was now making its way up the hill towards their sanctuary. The shambling mass moved slowly but with an unrelenting determination. The camp, once a place of safety, now braced for an onslaught. The survivors scrambled to fortify their defences, but the sense of despair was palpable. They had sought to turn the tide against the werewolves, but in doing so, they had brought a different kind of doom upon themselves. As the zombies neared, their groans and the dragon of their feet grew louder, a grim soundtrack to the impending siege. The survivors gripped their weapons tightly, faces set in grim determination. They had faced the terror of werewolves. Now they must confront the consequence of their desperate gamble, an army of the undead, their numbers growing with each werewolf they had turned. The night sky, once a canvas for the stars, now bore witness to a world caught in the grip of monsters of their own making. The survivors stood ready, not just to fight for their lives, but for the very soul of what it meant to be human in a world that had forgotten its humanity. The battle lines were drawn, and the night ahead promised only darkness and despair. Final Chapter The Cost of Survival As the relentless tide of the undead advanced up the hill, the survivors steel themselves for the inevitable clash. The camp, once a place of refuge and hope, now echoed with the sounds of preparation for war. This was not just a battle for survival. It was a battle to uphold the remnants of their humanity in a world overrun by nightmares. The first wave of zombies crashed against their defences with mindless ferocity. 
The survivors fought with a desperation born of knowing that this was a fight they could not afford to lose. Captain Donovan led the charge, his military training and unyielding resolve turning him into a formidable force against the shambling horde. Dr. Lanan Ngoyen and Dr. Alexei Petrov, those scientists by trade, fought with equal determination, using every tool and makeshift weapon at their disposal. The battle was brutal and exhausting, but unlike the werewolves, the zombies were slow and predictable. It gave the survivors an edge they had never had before. After hours that felt like an eternity, the tide of undead began to wane. One by one, the zombies fell, until the ground was littered with their lifeless forms. As the sun began to rise, casting its light on the aftermath of the night's battle, the survivors took a moment to catch their breath. They had won, against odds that would have been insurmountable had their foes been werewolves. There was a sense of cautious relief in the air. The decision to unleash the zombie virus, as harrowing as it was, had given them a fighting chance. For the first time since the werewolf plague began, they felt a glimmer of hope, a sense that they might survive this new, twisted world they had helped create. But their respite was short-lived. As they surveyed the horizon, their hearts sank. Another horde of undead, larger and more relentless than the first, was making its way toward the camp. The reality of their situation settled in like a cold, unyielding weight. This was their new world, a world where victory was fleeting and every triumph was followed by a greater challenge. The survivors braced themselves once again, knowing that this cycle of battle and brief respite might be their fate for days, months, maybe even years to come. They had chosen this path over a world dominated by werewolves, but the cost of that choice was a never-ending struggle against an enemy that knew no fatigue, no fear, and no mercy. As the final chapter of their story closed, the survivors stood together, united in their resolve. They had made their choice and now they would face the consequences, fighting not just for their lives, but for the essence of what it meant to be human in a world that had lost its way. The end was not a conclusion, but a statement on the enduring spirit of humanity, a testament to the courage, resilience, and indomitable will to survive against all odds. The story ended not with peace, but with the determination to keep fighting for as long as they had breath in their bodies. In the ravaged world of Crimson Dawn, humanity teeters on the brink of extinction, besieged by endless hordes of the undead. Amidst this chaos, a desperate alliance forms between the last survivors and the most unexpected of allies. Ancient, bloodthirsty beings emerging from the shadows of legend as they unite against the overwhelming tide of zombies. Secrets are unveiled, betrayals surface, and sacrifices are made. Witness a high-stakes struggle where every choice could mean the difference between survival and annihilation. Dive into a post-apocalyptic journey of survival where the lines between predator and prey blur and the cost of life hangs in the balance. Crimson Dawn isn't just a tale of survival, it's an epic saga of humanity's fight against the darkest odds, where the true monsters may not be who you expect. Chapter 1 The Fall The sun hung low in a dust-choked sky, casting an eerie pallor over the crumbling cityscape. Once a bustling metropolis, the city now lay in ruins, its skyscrapers reduced to skeletal frames streets littered with overturned cars and shattered glass. Nature, untamed and relentless, had begun to reclaim the concrete jungle, with wild vines ensnaring the remnants of civilization. Amidst this desolation, the undead roamed. They shuffled through the streets, a grotesque parody of the living, their moans a constant, haunting refrain. These once-human creatures 
bore the ravages of decay, their flesh hanging in tatters, eyes hollow with an insatiable hunger. The air was thick with the stench of death and rot, a putrid miasma that permeated every corner. Flies buzzed in thick swarms around the bodies that littered the ground, a testament to the recent carnage. The sky, perpetually overcast, seemed to mourn the fall of humanity, shed in a perpetual twilight that veiled the world in shadows. In the heart of the city, a dilapidated supermarket served as a macabre tableau. Its once well-stocked shelves were now bare, save for scattered, moldy remnants of food. A sign hung crookedly above the entrance, its cheerful colours faded and peeling. The aisles, once alive with the chatter of shoppers, were now a labyrinth of despair, hosting a slow dance of the undead. As night approached, the howls of more aggressive creatures echoed in the distance. These nocturnal predators, remnants of a society long gone, hunted in packs, their cries sending shivers through the spine of any unfortunate enough to hear them. Survivors, a rare breed, hid in the shadows of this once great city. They moved with caution, their lives a constant struggle against the unrelenting tide of the undead. They were scavengers in a land of plenty, where the greatest abundance was death itself. Their faces, gaunt and weary, told stories of loss, resilience, and an unyielding will to endure. In one such hideout, nestled within the hollowed remains of an apartment building, a group of survivors huddled around a flickering candle. Their whispered conversations were a mix of fear and determination, a testament to the human spirit's unbreakable resolve. They spoke of rumours, of places where life still thrived, of sanctuaries untouched by the apocalypse. But outside their fragile haven, the undead waited, relentless and ever hungry. A reminder that in this new world, every moment was a battle for survival. As the chapter closes, the moon rises high, casting its silver glow over the city's wreckage. The night brings new terrors, but for the moment, the survivor's hideout remains undiscovered. The world outside is a symphony of nightmares, a place where humanity's twilight has given way to an era of horror and despair. Chapter 2 – The Last Bastion In the ruins of what was once a vibrant suburban neighbourhood, surrounded by a makeshift barricade of rusted cars and barbed wire, stood the fortified camp. This refuge housed a group of survivors, each a stark emblem of human resilience. At the heart of the camp, a fire crackled in an improvised pit, casting a warm, flickering light. Around it sat the survivors, their faces etched with the scars of their ordeal. This group was diverse. A former teacher, a mechanic, a doctor, and others who had once led ordinary lives, now united by their shared fight for survival. As the night deepened, they gathered to discuss their future, a conversation laden with urgency and sombre realism. The group's leader, a stern woman named Elena, spoke first. She detailed the grim reality. Their resources were dwindling, scavenging missions were becoming increasingly perilous, and their numbers were slowly but steadily diminishing. The truth is, we can't sustain ourselves like this much longer, Elena said, her voice heavy with the burden of leadership. Our food supplies are running low, medical stocks are almost depleted, and we've lost too many to the undead. The doctor, a middle-aged man named Samuel, added to Elena's points. It's not just about resources, he said, adjusting his glasses. We're facing a more fundamental problem. The undead are relentless and with the fall of major cities and the loss of infrastructure, there are no safe places left to produce or store enough food. We're losing our ability to treat illnesses and injuries. At this rate, humanity can't sustain itself. We will collapse and become extinct within a few years. A 
young woman named Maya, once a university student, chimed in with a note of despair in her voice. It's not just the physical challenges, she said. It's the psychological toll. We've seen families torn apart, friends lost. The constant fear and grief are wearing us down. How can we think of a future when each day is a struggle to survive? The mechanic, a burly man named Tom, broke the somber mood with a hint of determination. We can't give up hope, he said. We've made it this far. There has to be a way, a solution we haven't thought of yet. The group fell into a contemplative silence, each lost in their thoughts. The fire's glow waned, casting long shadows across their faces. Beyond the camp's walls, the sounds of the night were a constant reminder of the perilous world they inhabited. A world where the dead walked and the living dwindled, teetering on the brink of oblivion. As the chapter concludes, a sense of resolve begins to emerge among the survivors. Despite the overwhelming odds, they knew that giving up was not an option. The night wore on, and in the flickering firelight, they began to share ideas, desperate plans, and faint glimmers of hope, searching for a way to fight back against the darkness that had engulfed the world. Chapter 3 Echoes in the Ruins The morning sun broke through the grey clouds as a group of survivors from the camp made their way towards the city. Their mission was clear but perilous to search for supplies and any other survivors. The city, once a bustling hub of life, now stood silent and desolate, its streets empty, buildings looming like silent sentinels of a bygone era. The group, led by a determined young man named Alex, moved cautiously. Each member was armed with whatever they had managed to scavenge over the months, a baseball bat, a hunting knife, a rusty handgun with limited ammunition. They communicated in hushed tones, their eyes constantly scanning the lifeless surroundings. As they reached the city centre, a plaza surrounded by what were once shops and cafes, they paused. Alex stepped forward, taking a deep breath. Anyone here? He called out, his voice echoing off the buildings, a stark contrast to the oppressive silence. For a moment, there was no response, then faintly at first, came a sound that sent shivers down their spines, the unmistakable moan of the undead. It was a soft whisper, carried on the wind, growing louder and more numerous, like a chorus of the damned. The group exchanged panicked glances. The moaning swelled into a crescendo, and then, as if answering some unspoken command, the undead emerged. They poured out from the shadowed doorways of buildings, from the alleys, and from behind overturned cars. Their numbers were overwhelming, a tidal wave of decaying flesh and gnashing teeth. Alex and his team were frozen in horror. The moans were now deafening, a relentless sound that filled the air. The undead moved steadily closer, their movements slow but inexorable. The group was vastly outnumbered, their escape routes cut off by the advancing horde. Despair settled over the survivors. They had faced the undead before, but never in such numbers. This was no longer a mission for supplies. It was a struggle for sheer survival. The reality of their situation was stark and merciless. In this post-apocalyptic world, overrun by the undead, hope seemed like a distant memory. As the chapter closes, the group backs into a tighter circle weapons raised in a futile gesture of defiance. The moans of the undead grow louder, drowning out all other sounds. In the heart of the ruined city, surrounded by a sea of the walking dead, the last flicker of hope in their eyes dims under the overwhelming shadow of despair. The apocalypse, it seems, leaves no room for salvation. Chapter 4 Shadows and Salvation As the sun began its descent, Casting long shadows over the decaying city, Alex and his group found themselves backed against an old crumbling wall. The undead, numbering in the hundreds, closed in on them, a relentless, shambling mass. With no escape in sight, the group faced the grim reality of their situation. 
In these final moments, as the undead drew near, the survivors looked at each other, understanding the inevitable. They exchanged quiet farewells, each accepting their fate with a mix of fear and resignation. Alex's voice steady, offered a few words of solace. We did our best, he said. In this world, that's more than most can say. Just then, as the first of the undead reached out with rotting hands, something inexplicable happened. A shadow, swift and silent, began to move through the horde. The undead did not seem to notice this presence, but as it passed through them, they fell to the ground, lifeless. The survivors watched in stunned disbelief as the shadow moved with lethal grace, cutting a swath through the undead. But still, the horde pressed on, seemingly endless. Suddenly, the shadow materialized in front of them. It was an old man, his skin like weathered leather, his eyes piercing in their intensity. We cannot keep this up for long unless we feed, he said, his voice a rasping whisper. I need the blood of the living. I will only take what I need. It's your only hope of survival, and it will not kill you. The group exchanged wary glances, fear and confusion written on their faces. After a tense moment, Maya stepped forward, her expression resolute. Do what you must, she said. The vampire fared quickly, only taking enough to sustain his strength. He then rejoined the fray, moving back into the sea of undead. Another shadow appeared, this time a woman, her old and haggard. Quickly, she urged, I need blood or we all die. Tom stepped forward without hesitation, offering himself for the sacrifice. Minutes passed, an eternity to the besieged group. Then the two vampires materialized again. We have cleared a path, the old man announced. You need to move now. With no time to question or ponder this strange turn of events, the group followed the direction indicated by the vampires. They ran through the opening, dodging the fallen undead, their minds racing with a mix of fear, relief, and disbelief. Miraculously, they made it out of the city and began the long journey back to camp. The night was filled with their hushed, urgent discussions about what had transpired. Questions abounded, but answers were scarce. Who were these mysterious saviors? And what did this new, strange alliance mean for the future of humanity? As they arrived back at camp, the first light of dawn was breaking. They were met with looks of shock and relief from their fellow survivors. Exhausted, but alive, they knew that their world had changed forever. The battle against the undead had taken an unexpected turn, and now the fight for survival had evolved into something entirely new and uncharted. Chapter 5 Alliance of Shadows The campfire crackled softly as the group recounted the harrowing events in the city. Their fellow survivors listened in disbelief, the tale sounding more like a myth than reality. Just as Alex finished describing their unlikely rescue, the two shadowy figures from the city materialized within the camp, causing a stir of panic and awe. Do not be alarmed, the old man spoke, his voice resonant yet calming. We mean you no harm. Times have changed. We, who have lurked in the shadows for an eternity, must now step into the light. Your world is doomed, and with it, so is ours. Though we feed on your kind, there is no longer enough of you left for us to subsist on. Therefore, we offer an alliance in exchange for payment. The camp erupted into a cacophony of reactions, shock, fear, disbelief. Elena, trying to maintain order, addressed the beings. You talk of vampires, like in the storybooks, she asked incredulously. We do not like to be called vampires. That is your name for our kin. We are simply elder beings, the old woman explained, her voice weary with age. We have lived for an eternity 
and we do not wish to die now, due to these shambling undead. Questions poured forth from the group. How can you help us? Why didn't you come sooner? Where have you been hiding? Are there more of you? Can you save us? The elder beings listened patiently. Then the old man spoke. We have powers that you cannot fathom. Abilities honed over centuries. We chose isolation, for your kind has always feared and hunted us. We remained hidden, watching the world change. But now, we face extinction, just as you do. The woman added, Our numbers are few, but we are powerful. We can help protect you, guide you to safer grounds, even fight alongside you. But our strength wanes without sustenance. We need your blood but we vow only to take what is necessary and no more. The camp was silent, processing to this unimaginable proposition. Alex finally spoke up. If we do this, if we agree to this alliance, what happens next? How do we coexist? The elder beings exchanged a glance, an unspoken understanding passing between them. We must work together, the old man said. Our survival now depends on each other. We will share our knowledge, our strength. Together, we can find a way to turn the tide against the undead. As the fire burned low, the group deliberated. The proposition was frightening, but the alternative was certain doom. Slowly, a consensus formed. This alliance, unnatural and fraught with danger, was their best chance at survival. The night ended with a tentative agreement, a pact forged between the living and the ancient beings. As dawn approached, a new chapter in their struggle for survival began, filled with uncertainty, but also a glimmer of hope in the face of overwhelming darkness. Chapter 6 The Elder's Dilemma Before the world succumbed to the undead, the elder beings existed on the fringes of human society, shrouded in secrecy. They were far from the storybook vampires glamorized in films and literature. These creatures were parasitic, reliant on the blood of the living to sustain their prolonged shadowy existence. The chapter opens in a time before the outbreak, in a dimly lit underground haven. Here, the elder beings resided, their appearance starkly contrasting the popular image of vampires they were old, weathered, their skin like dried parchment, stretched over brittle bones. Their eyes, though ageless, carried a tiredness that spoke of centuries lived in the shadows. They could not pass for humans. They looked too sickly, too aged. As the zombie outbreak began, the elders watched from their hidden sanctuaries with growing concern. Initially, they saw the chaos as a mere curiosity, a temporary disruption in the world above. But as cities fell and humanity dwindled, they realized the gravity of the situation. Their food supply was vanishing. The elders had one advantage. They could walk among the undead undetected, as they too were devoid of life in the traditional sense. But this offered little solace. They could not feed on the dead and opportunities to feed from the living became increasingly scarce. In the depths of their lair, the elders convened, a gathering that hadn't occurred for many decades. They debated their course of action, their voices echoing in the cold stone chamber. The reality was clear. Without the living, their existence was threatened. An ancient, wizened figure among them known as the Sage, spoke, We must adapt or we perish. The living are our salvation as much as we are theirs. Our survival now intertwines with theirs in a way we never anticipated. A plan began to take shape, one of mutual survival. They would emerge from the shadows, offer their strength and knowledge in exchange for sustenance. It was a desperate measure a gamble that went against centuries of secrecy and isolation. But desperate times called for desperate measures. As the chapter closes, 
the elders, once rulers of the night, now faced a new reality. Their age-old existence was upended, forcing them into an uneasy alliance with their prey. This was a new era, one where the line between predator and protector blurred, and survival hinged on the fragile bond between the living and those who had lived too long. Chapter 7 The Unholy Pact Back at the camp, after much deliberation and with a sense of grave necessity, the group agreed to align with the Elder Beings. The two representatives of the Elders, now identified as Varric and Alara, nodded in acceptance. Excellent. Varric responded with a gravelly voice. There are five of us, five Elders. Each will require sustenance daily. Your camp, with over twenty survivors, can sustain this with ease. We shall begin to clear the city. It is exhausting work, so please uphold your end of the bargain. We will also search for survivors and bring them here. The scene shifted to an uneasy but necessary act of survival. The survivors lined up, their expressions a mix of fear and resolve. One by one, they approached the elders to fulfill their part of the pact. As Varric and Elara fed, it was an uncomfortable, almost macabre scene. They drank not with the grace or elegance often depicted in law, but like parasites, urgently and with a primal need. The act was quick, each elder taking only what was necessary, yet it left a palpable tension in the air. With their strength renewed, the five elders, Varric, Alara, the Sage, and two others, named Rhys and Morella, ventured into the city at dusk. Their ability to move in shadow form was remarkable, allowing them to traverse the undead infested streets with supernatural speed. As they passed through the hordes of undead, their shadow forms proved lethal. The explanation lay in the nature of their existence. As beings that straddled the line between life and death, their shadows were anathema to the undead. Their mere presence disrupted the unnatural force animating the zombies, causing them to collapse, lifeless. It was as if the shadows of the elders contained a purifying element, an antithesis to the corruption that fueled the undead. The chapter vividly described the elders' assault. With swift, fluid movements, they weaved through the undead, their forms blurring into the night. Each pass left swathes of the undead falling, creating a path of destruction through the once teeming city. As the elders worked tirelessly, their efforts bore fruit. The streets gradually cleared, making the city less perilous. The survivors in the camp watched from afar, a mix of awe and apprehension in their eyes. The pact with the elders, though unsettling, offered a glimmer of hope, a chance to reclaim their world from the clutches of the undead. The chapter concluded with the camp settling into an uneasy routine, the daily exchanges between the elders and the survivors becoming a grim part of their new, new reality. In this bleak world, the line between saviour and parasite blurred, and survival hinged on the uneasy alliance between the living and those who had defied death for centuries. Chapter 8 Tenuous Harmony As the days passed, the camp began to witness an unexpected transformation. Strangers, weary and grateful, started arriving, each recounting how the elders had found and saved them from the undead-ridden wastelands. With these new arrivals, the camp's numbers bolstered, infusing a renewed sense of vigour and purpose among the survivors. Life in the camp gradually took on a semblance of normalcy, as humans worked together to create sustainable food sources and secure fresh water supplies. The presence of the elders, though still a source of unease, began to feel less ominous as they exchanged knowledge that proved invaluable. They shared ancient methods of healing, using natural remedies and innovative techniques for agriculture that could thrive in this blighted world. The camp's defences improved, 
becoming more robust and secure. For the first time since the outbreak, a sense of hope rekindled in the hearts of the survivors. Laughter and conversation, once rare commodities, became more frequent around the campfire. Children, who had grown accustomed to silence and fear, began to play in the camp's safer corners. However, beneath this burgeoning sense of community and progress, a current of dissent flowed. A small faction within the camp, led by a hardened man named Donovan, viewed the alliance with the elders with growing resentment. They're just helping us as they would help cattle. To them, we're nothing but food. Donovan whispered conspiratorially to his followers. Meetings were held in hushed tones under the cover of darkness, as this group planned to revolt against the camp leadership and the elders. They saw the pact as a betrayal of humanity, a surrender to creatures that they believed saw them as mere sustenance. Donovan rallied his followers with impassioned speeches about freedom and the danger of becoming dependent on the elders. As the chapter drew to a close, the camp, once a symbol of survival against all odds, stood on the brink of internal strife. The delicate balance achieved through the alliance with the elders faced a threat not from the outside, but from within. Unbeknownst to the camp's leaders and the elders, plans were being laid that could unravel the fragile peace and safety they had worked so hard to build. In the dead of night, Donovan and his followers sharpened their weapons and steeled their resolve, preparing to act on their convictions. The camp, asleep and unaware, was on the cusp of a conflict that could change the course of their survival and redefine the nature of their alliance with the Elder Being. Chapter 9 The Breaking Point The nightly routine in the camp had become a familiar scene. Members of the now thriving community lined up to fulfill their part of the agreement with the Elders. Tensions, however, were simmering beneath the surface. As one member, a close ally of Donovan, stepped forward in line, he suddenly shouted, I refuse to feed these parasites. We are nothing but cattle to them. His outburst sparked an immediate uproar in the camp. Some rallied to his side, echoing his sentiments, while others argued vehemently in defense of the elders, reminding the dissenters of how they had been saved from certain doom. The camp was split into two factions, each side vehemently arguing their perspective. The air was thick with anger and fear, the situation teetering on the edge of violence. In the midst of the chaos, the sage, the most venerable of the elders, stepped forward. Stop, he commanded, his voice resonating with an authority that quieted the crowd. You are free to leave this place any time you wish, and you are free to end our agreement whenever you desire. It is a mutual, beneficial agreement. Yes, we need to feed, but you also hold our existence in your hands, as we hold yours. Without you, we will perish. The sage continued, his words reflecting a philosophy of mutual benefit and trade. Our alliance is not based on altruism or charity. It is a partnership where both parties gain something of value. This is the essence of a fair exchange, a principle that ensures survival and prosperity for both sides. Donovan stepped forward, his face twisted in anger. I refuse to be treated as cattle, he spat. Before he could continue, Alex interrupted. No, Donovan, what you want is to have your cake and everyone else's too. This mindset, the desire to take from those who produce and create stability, while adding nothing of value yourself, is why humanity failed. You want to gain power through the efforts of others, seeing it as your entitlement. That's not going to happen here. You are free to leave and face the world without the help of our allies, but don't bring your destructive ideas here. In a sudden, rash move, Donovan lunged at the sage with a wooden stake, but to everyone's astonishment, 
The stake passed right through the Elder, as if he were made of mist. That only works in the storybooks, the sage said calmly. The group, now firmly against Donovan and his ideology, quickly restrained him. After a brief but intense discussion, Donovan and a few of his followers were expelled from the camp. As they disappeared into the night, a sense of resolution settled over the camp. The chapter closed on a somber note, the community understanding the fragile nature of their situation more than ever. They had chosen survival, cooperation, and the difficult path of working with the elders. In this new world, the old rules no longer applied, and survival meant adapting to the unimaginable. Chapter 10 The Piper's Revenge In the shrouded darkness beyond the camp, Donovan plotted their vengeance. They'll regret throwing us out, he hissed. If I can't have peace, then neither will they. Time passed, and life in the community flourished. The survivors, under the guidance of the elders, strengthened their defences and resources, creating a semblance of stability in the chaotic world. One sunny afternoon, a strange noise disrupted the calm. Sounds like an ice cream van, remarked one of the camp members, puzzled, but the whimsical sound was a stark contrast to the horror that approached. Far in the distance, a vast cloud of dust billowed towards the camp. At first glance, it looked like a massive black smoke, but as it drew nearer, the chilling truth became apparent. Thousands of undead, shuffling and kicking up the ground, forming a relentless tide of death. At the forefront was Donovan, holding a makeshift speaker that blared a high-pitched nursery rhyme tune, eerily out of place amidst the horror it heralded. He's like the Pied Piper, observed another camp member, but leading zombies instead of rats. Alex, sensing the imminent danger, sprang into action. Man the defences, he shouted. The elders can't help us in the daytime. We're on our own. The camp quickly mobilised. Thanks to the knowledge shared by the elders, their defences were robust, but whether they could withstand such a massive onslaught was uncertain. The walls and barricades, reinforced with every available resource, braced for impact. As the horde approached, the camp readied themselves for the battle. Archers took their positions, while others armed themselves with whatever weapons they could find. The tension was palpable, the waiting excruciating. The undead, drawn by the haunting melody, advanced relentlessly. The camp's defenders steeled themselves, knowing that their survival depended on holding out until nightfall, when the elders could join the fight. The chapter closed on a scene of impending doom, the camp facing its greatest challenge yet. As the undead drew closer, the melody of the nursery rhyme played on, a macabre soundtrack to the desperate struggle that awaited them. The fate of the camp, now hanging in the balance, would soon be decided in a clash between the living and the damned, with the shadow of betrayal looming over all. Chapter 11 The battle erupted with a ferocity that shook the very foundations of the camp. A seemingly endless tide of undead crashed against the camp's defences, each wave testing the resolve and resourcefulness of the survivors. Donovan, having unleashed his vengeful horde, vanished into the chaos, a satisfied smirk on his face as he disappeared into the shadows. His betrayal had brought the camp to the brink of annihilation, but he seemed indifferent to the fate of those he had once lived among. The survivors fought with desperate courage, Arrows whistled through the air, makeshift weapons clashed against rotten flesh, and cries of determination echoed above the groans of the undead. The fortifications, strengthened by the wisdom of the elders, held fast against the onslaught, but the horde was vast, their numbers seemingly inexhaustible. Alex, at the forefront of the defence, rallied the camp with shouts of encouragement. We just need to hold until nightfall. He yelled, his voice a beacon of hope amidst the despair. 
His figure, silhouetted against the chaos, was a testament to human resilience. Amid the clatter and clash of the battle, a fellow survivor, her face smeared with soot and sweat, turned to Alex. Will even the elders be able to stop this many? She shouted over the din of combat. Her question hung in the air, a stark reminder of the scale of their predicament. The chapter depicted a relentless struggle for survival. Every survivor, from the youngest to the oldest, fought with a fierce determination. They understood that this was not just a battle against the undead. It was a fight for the future of humanity, for the right to live in a world not ruled by darkness. As the sun began its slow descent, painting the sky in hues of orange and red, the intensity of the battle reached its zenith. The camp, a small island of life amidst a sea of death, held on with dwindling strength and dwindling hope. The chapter closed with the survivors, battered and exhausted, bracing for the next wave of undead. In the fading light, they clung to the hope that the elders would emerge with the night bringing with them the strength to turn the tide. But the question remained, would their combined forces be enough to overcome this seemingly endless horde? Chapter 12, The Ultimate Sacrifice. The camp's last line of defense crumbled under the relentless pressure of the undead. The defenses are breached. A cry of terror rang out as waves of mindless zombies stumbled into the heart of the camp. Panic and chaos ensued as the survivors fell back to a small, makeshift fortification, their faces etched with fear and desperation. As night enveloped the world, the elders awoke to the commotion. Sensing the dire situation, they rushed to aid the embattled camp. The survivors, huddled in their final stand, looked up to see the elders approach. Their faces, a mix of hope and dread. The sage, the eldest and wisest among them, surveyed the overwhelming scene. We are too late, he murmured. If the humans fall, we starve and fall with them. We cannot clear this many enemies. We are doomed unless. With those words hanging in the air, the sage's shadow roared upwards into the night, then descended with supernatural speed striking the ground in the midst of the camp. His shadow form erupted outward like a wave of sound, a dark energy sweeping through the undead. Each creature it touched collapsed, lifeless. The wave of shadow energy, harmless to the living, was an awe-inspiring sight, expanding outward and fell in the zombie horde in its wake. No, Varric screamed understanding the cost of this miraculous intervention. The humans of the camp, witnessing the impossible, cheered, their lives saved once again by the elders. But as the shadow wave dissipated, a tragic scene was revealed. The sage's lifeless body lay where he had landed. The elders gathered around him, their expressions a mixture of grief and respect. The sage had sacrificed his eternal life for the survival of not just the humans, but his fellow elders as well. He had known this was the only choice. Without his sacrifice, if both humans and elders would have perished. Varric and the other elders turned to face the human survivors, their faces somber in the dim light. As the camp members gathered around the fallen sage, a silence fell over the crowd. Varric spoke his voice carrying a weight of sorrow and wisdom. This, Varric began, shows the necessity of working together for mutual benefit. Our greatest elder has sacrificed his eternal life to save us all. Let us no longer question who benefits more in our alliance. Instead, let us focus on building the best version of life we can, together. The chapter closed on a somber yet hopeful note. The survivors, united in their grief for the sage, also felt a renewed sense of purpose. The sacrifice of the sage had not only saved them, but also solidified the bond between the humans and the elders. The path ahead was uncertain, but now 
More than ever, they understood the value of their alliance and the potential of what they could build together. Final chapter, Echoes of Vengeance. In a small clearing, surrounded by the remnants of a once flourishing world, Donovan sat brooding with two of his remaining followers. Damn them, he shouted, slamming his fist on the ground. We need to come up with another way to get payback. As they plotted their revenge against the camp and the elders, a chilling noise pierced the silence of the night. Heavy breathing, a deep guttural snarl, as if emanating from a savage beast, filled the air. They looked up, fear etching their faces, to see a terrifying sight, a massive wolf-like creature, its eyes glowing with a ferocious intensity. Before they had a chance to react, the beast was upon them. Their cries of terror and agony were swallowed by the vast emptiness of the wilderness, unheard by any living soul. The following day, a small group of undead, aimlessly wandering, stumbled upon the clearing where Donovan and his followers had met their gruesome fate. The scene was eerily quiet, devoid of life or a grim reminder of the world's harsh realities. As the undead shuffled through, they trampled over four sets of wolf tracks imprinted in the muddy ground. One set was noticeably larger than the others, suggesting the presence of an alpha creature, a being of formidable strength and power. The final chapter concluded with a sense of poetic justice. Donovan's quest for revenge had led to his undoing, a reminder that in a world overrun by darkness and death, the true monsters weren't always the undead or the supernatural beings of lore. Sometimes, the greatest danger lay in the hearts of men. The story of Crimson Dawn closed with the world still in the grip of Apocalypse, but with a glimmer of hope. The alliance between the survivors and the elders, forged in necessity and sacrifice, stood as a testament to the resilience of life and the potential for unlikely bonds to form even in the direst of times. Thank you for joining me on this chilling journey. If your thirst for the unknown and the unexplained is still unquenched, I invite you to delve deeper into the abyss of terror. Just beyond the veil of reality, another story awaits to send shivers down your spine. Dare to join me in the next video, where the unknown becomes known and the unseen seen. Until then, keep the lights dim and your mind open. This is Professor Shadow, signing off.